Due to the bad weather this week, today we're going to take a deep dive into some cooling system issues and we're going to bolt the supercharger to the little diesel engine so we can work out any problems that may exist. But before we get started, I want to thank you folks for all the comments and suggestions I got on the previous video. I ended up taking a lot of notes and we're collecting stuff in order to bring you part two of that episode. So stay tuned for that. A few episodes ago, we put a piece of corrugated plastic in front of the radiator, and the purpose was, of course, to get the engine to run hotter. Actually, to be more specific, it was to get the engine to run at an ideal operating temperature, and this serves two purposes. First, it improves fuel efficiency, and second, it'll help heat the interior of the car. And trust me, it's no fun driving this car in the bitter cold. Anyway, the full sheet of corrugated plastic was a bit much, and in order to keep the engine from overheating, the electric cooling fan had to be used more often than not. So, we went and cut a small section of the corrugated plastic away to provide a nominal amount of airflow to the radiator, and that pretty much ruined everything. This is a problem, but at the same time, it isn't a problem. You see, the problem is it's cold outside, and, well, that's kind of a winter thing. Anyway, here in Kansas, it's fixing to start warming up in a few weeks, so I'm not too concerned about getting the engine to operate perfectly in extreme cold temperatures. But let's see if we can do something about it. Let's take a closer look at the thermostat for this little Kubota diesel engine. And not much to look at. Aside from its extra small size, it looks like any other thermostat. You know, I have a hunch that this little bypass hole in the thermostat may be causing our engine to run cold. You see, this is a 180 degree thermostat and it just ain't getting the job done. So, as an experiment, I reckon we should see what would happen if we plug the bypass hole up. But before we do anything, I want to do some measuring. Before we modify the thermostat, let's get some video on how long it takes for this engine to warm up if we let it idle. Yeah, the video is a bit shaky and I didn't realize this until after the engine was running and at this point I have to continue with the test. Although I do try to get a more stable shot on the gauge, meh, this is good enough. Anyway, I sped this up quite a bit because this takes a while. Now the first data point we want to capture is how long it takes the engine to get to 160 degrees Fahrenheit. And after 17 and a half minutes, the engine finally hits 160 degrees Fahrenheit. Now remember, this is a 180 degree thermostat and we still have a fair amount to go to get there. You know, there are several reasons why it's taking so long. First, it's cold outside. Second, well, the engine is just idling and this tiny engine doesn't consume much fuel at idle and as a result, it doesn't get very hot. Thirdly, the bypass hole in the thermostat is allowing some of the hot coolant to flow through the radiator. Now some of you may be wondering the purpose of the bypass hole. It's to allow bubbles to escape if air were to get into the cooling system. Without the bypass hole, it takes forever to burp all the air from the cooling system. But it can be done, so it's safe to eliminate the hole for now. And I've also read that the bypass hole allows the engine to warm up faster. This doesn't make sense to me, but perhaps there's something I'm missing. And finally, it took 33 minutes, 49 seconds to reach a tick below 190 degrees Fahrenheit. Good enough. Now that we have some data, let's modify the thermostat. So this thermostat is made mostly from stainless steel, and it would take a silver type solder and a lot of heat to solder this hole shut. So I went ahead and installed a tiny stainless steel screw and nut. Now as a precaution, I went ahead and crushed the threads on the screw with some vice grips, and that's to prevent the nut from backing out. I'm sure it wouldn't hurt anything if these parts fell into the cooling system, but it would be nice if they didn't. Okay, now the hard part. Since I opened up the cooling system, I have to purge all the air from it. On this car, it's a bit tougher because the highest point of the cooling system is slightly above the radiator cap, and I find it slightly easier to purge the cooling system with the front of the car jacked up. You know, I actually have the parts to fix this issue, but that's a job for another day. Anyway, as you can see it's raining today and it's been raining for the past few days now. The problem with the rain is, on the less traveled back roads it's causing black ice and that's not a good thing for a lightweight car like this one. 
Okay, so it's the next day and the engine has cooled down overnight. And now we can start it up and see if the thermostat modifications help speed up the warm up time. In case you weren't taking notes, which I'm sure a lot of you folks do, it took just over 17 and a half minutes to get to 160 degrees. Now since this car is stored inside the shop at night, the starting temperature of both tests should be close to 55 degrees Fahrenheit. And it looks like it took 15 and a half minutes to get to 160 degrees. Now that's still a long time, but at idle this engine doesn't really generate a lot of heat. Now let's see how long it takes to get to a tick below 190 degrees. And it looks like it took an extra couple of minutes. I have to admit this doesn't make sense, but it is what it is. So at this point, I decided to do some actual research on thermostats. And according to many resources, the temperature of the thermostat is rated for is the temperature when the thermostat thingy is wide open. Now, this is where it gets tricky. The thermostat usually starts to open about 20 degrees before its rated temperature. So in our case, the 180 degree thermostat, well, for the most part, the thermostat should start actually opening at 160 degrees and be fully open by 180. Unfortunately, a slightly open thermostat is enough to cause the engine to run cool. But let's also consider the engine isn't doing any work, it's just idling. Perhaps if we put a load on the engine, the modified thermostat would behave differently. And that's a test for another day. Let's see what happens if we turn the electric cooling fan on. And yeah, the temperature is going down. Now with the 180 degree thermostat, I would expect the temp to hold right about here. But nope, it's still dropping. And it seems to finally settle down at 160 degrees. So if you watch the gauge long enough, you can actually see with the cooling fan on, the engine temp is stable and the temperature needle will go up and down by one or two degrees. And that's because the thermostat is opening a tiny bit at perhaps 162 degrees and allowing just enough coolant to pass through and get to the radiator and cause the thermostat to close at 160. Remember, this is a small engine and it's slow to generate any heat at idle. Unfortunately, we really need to do a road test on the car to see if this modified thermostat helps. And that ain't gonna happen today. But also keep in mind that the problem we are trying to solve is not really a problem at all because in a few weeks we'll be back in the mid 60s here in Kansas. So for now, the best solution is likely to just keep the corrugated plastic in front of the radiator. Or is it? You know, I got a comment from one of the viewers and he indicated that on his older Volvo there was sort of a window shade type cover in front of the radiator and in extreme cold weather he could pull on a cable or a string and it completely covered the radiator. And as the car warmed up, releasing some of the tension on the cable would expose some of the radiator and allow the radiator to get enough air to keep the engine cool. I reckon on modern cars, there's something similar with shutters in front of the radiator. Now, adopting shutters from a random car to work on this little Honda is a bit more than I want to do, but this window shade idea, well, it's awesome. So, I custom ordered a window shade for this radiator. The vinyl is waterproof and UV tolerant, and the case is made from extruded aluminum. This is actually a really well built window shade and we'll be replacing the corrugated plastic with this thing and basically that should solve 99.9% .9 of our cooling system problems in the cold weather. Let's take a look at how the stupid charger is coming along. Off camera we've been working on the supercharger mounting brackets on our spare D722 engine and as you can see we have a lot of the fitment issues worked out. Now in the past, we installed an AMR 300 stupid charger on a 420cc Predator engine, and for that setup, we ran a 1 to 1 ratio for the drive system. The 1 to 1 drive ratio on the little Predator engine allowed the supercharger to develop 8 PSI of boost, which doesn't seem like much, but on a Predator engine, that was enough to blow every gasket out of the engine twice. Anyway, on the 719cc Kubota diesel engine, we're using a slightly larger AMR 500 supercharger and we're running a slight overdrive. Now I haven't calculated the ratio yet but I'm not really sure that matters. You see on this setup we're using the stock pulleys on the Kubota engine and the stock pulley on the supercharger. This is of course the cheapest and simplest configuration. Our goal is to generate between 8 and 10 psi of boost and well we'll likely fall short of that goal but by how much well I don't know and the only way to find out is to give it a try and see what we get. 
Due to the motor mount braces getting in the way, we had to add this idler bearing so the drive belt would clear the obstruction, and as a bonus, this idler puts more of the belt in contact with both the drive and the driven pulleys. The supercharger pivots on these two mounting points, and that gives us some flexibility in the event we have to make slight adjustments. At this point, we still need to fabricate an additional bracket that anchors the supercharger to the engine block, but we can't do that until we trial fit this setup in the car. The idler bearing is a common bearing that's used on a lot of timing belt drive systems, and it's nothing special. It comes really close to the oil filter, but not close enough to cause any problems. Now, it would be nice if this supercharger mounting bracket worked as is, but if it doesn't, not a big deal. You see, this bracket is simple enough to modify or even completely replace if we have to. Actually, let me take the supercharger off so you can get a better look at the bracket. So yeah, it's just a chunk of angle iron with a few tabs welded onto it. Simple and sweet. Oh, before we test fit all this stuff in a car, I just wanted to point out that the crank pulley on these engines are balanced to the engine, and swapping this pulley for a larger one is impossible. Well, it can be done, but the engine will be out of balance. Now, if we do find we need a larger pulley, the good news is we already have a solution, so no worries. But before we do anything, I want to see how close we can get to generating 8 to 10 PSI with the stock pulleys. You know, we might just get lucky. So on the car, I've been reserving this space for the supercharger. Now, since day one of this engine swap, there have been certain areas in the engine compartment that have been completely off limits, and that's because this project isn't totally random, although it may seem that way. Nope, I'm afraid I actually put some thought into this project. In order to mount the supercharger, we'll need to remove this bracket and replace it with the supercharger bracket. It's almost plug and play, and that's the way it was designed. It's going to be a tight fit, but according to my measurements, it'll fit. <laughs> Let's see if that's true. So fast forward a bit, and we have the car up on jack stands again. It's a shame. All that time I spent burping the air out of the cooling system, well, it'll have to be done all over again. And that's because in order to open up some space so you folks get a better look at what's going on, I had to remove a lot of stuff, including the radiator hoses. Oh well, it could be worse. So as you can see, the supercharger fits, and there's no clearance issues. With the supercharger in place, I can figure out the length of the induction plumbing from the supercharger to the back side of the engine. In case you're wondering, I do have an intercooler and I've reserved the space for the intercooler, but initially we're going to put this together without the intercooler. And the reason is, this is just an experiment. Once we prove that it works, then we can fine tune it. Anyway, all the charge pipes have been ordered, and we even managed to figure out how long the drive belt should be. So the good news is all the stuff's on the way, and we should have it here in a week or so. You know, I ain't telling you what to do, but if you aren't already subscribed, please consider doing so, because in a few weeks, we'll have the only 719cc supercharged Kubota diesel-powered Honda Insight in the known universe. And you don't want to miss any of that. Anyway, on the bottom side of the supercharger is the intake side. Right now, the intake flange is off the supercharger, but we did some measuring, and indeed, the flange and intake plumbing will in fact fit with the belly pan on the car. It's a tight fit, just like everything else. Oh, it looks like we have a little bit of a leak at the turbo drain. Hmm, I need to check that out, but not right now. The supercharger that we're using for this project is an AMR 500, and what that means is, it's a 500cc positive displacement roots type supercharger. This supercharger was originally intended to be used on the 660cc Japanese key class cars. Now, I'm not sure what the deal is, but these superchargers have found their way across the pond and now can be picked up on eBay or even on the jungle site. I actually picked this one up on the jungle site for 200 bucks. Now, for some people that may seem cheap, and for others that may seem expensive. You see, the prices for these are all over the place. What's interesting about this one is, the case hasn't been sandblasted or painted like a lot of them are. Nope, this one is super clean and looks virtually brand new. I guess I should mention that all of these superchargers are essentially used and are sold as remanufactured units. <laughs> you know, some of them are just spray painted and some of them are actually remanufactured. It's hit and miss, really. Anyway, whenever I mention this diesel-powered car is getting a supercharger, I receive a dozen or so notes or comments from concerned folks explaining the evils of a supercharger, and I should really consider using a turbo. Well, this project is more or less centered on putting a supercharger on a diesel engine, and we're like a freight train going full speed ahead with the supercharger, 
I certainly appreciate the comments and the effort some people put into them, but like it or not, this car is getting a supercharger. It'll be an interesting experiment, and best of all, since the supercharger is a positive displacement roots type, it doesn't have any lag, and that should help with a boost in power on gear changes, especially when shifting between 4th and 5th gear. So while we're waiting for better weather and some new parts, I figure we have time for one more important upgrade under the hood, and I'll tell you more about that in the next video. If you made it this far into the video, I'd like to thank you for staying around. Typically we don't show a lot of what goes on in the background, and perhaps now you have a better idea that the little things such as a thermostat and whatnot do take up a lot of time, and we usually don't film that because filming it easily doubles the time it takes. Anyway, it looks like I have a lot of work to take care of, so we'll see you next time. Until then.